Hey guys, Ryan here. The Somewhere in the Skies podcast is a labor of love every week. And with that comes many different costs to keep the show running. That's where our Patreon campaign comes in. You give what you think the show is worth. There's different rewards available all the time, including shoutouts on the show, early editions of main episodes, bonus episodes and content, and very soon, monthly patron hangouts, where we sit back and chat all things UFOs. So I hope you'll consider becoming a Patreon subscriber today. To learn more and to join, visit patreon.com slash somewhere skies. Thank you for your support and keep looking up. This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. Welcome everyone to Somewhere in the Skies. As always, I am your host, Ryan Sprague, and today we have with us yet again the head science writer at the debrief.org. So you know what that means. We're going to be talking all about space and tech and UFOs and aliens and everything in between. So let's not waste any time. We're going to break down a ton of his new exciting articles over at the debrief. So with us again is Christopher Plain of the debrief welcome back my man ryan thanks for having me on my good man hey anytime you send me that message that says i'm doing the hot guy show i need another hot guy to join me <laughs> i always tell you i'm there for you so uh we can we can give the fans what they always really want which is just you and i sit here looking good together so. our mugs i knew it I, we could say anything doesn't matter but no yeah. man we're gonna say some uh we're gonna talk about some really cool stuff you know um we've got a ton of stuff going on in the world of um emerging tech and oh yeah. and, and space exploration um so i kind of would love to just hop in with one of your most recent stories and that was this one uh exploring venus in a manta ray inspired spacecraft so yeah. i'm not going to even try to summarize this you are the man of the hour you're the one who wrote about this so why don't you tell us about this first one if you don't mind what is this craft that they're hoping to get over uh over to our neighbor venus so this is really really cool piece of technology ryan basically what happened about a week ago is nasa the uh, nasa institute for advanced concepts NIAC announced a round of about 13 grants. So this is something they're actually putting money into. And some of these grants are for advanced radar systems. Some of them are for different mission proposals. This grant is to explore building and designing exactly what you said. It looks like a, a triangle, like a manta ray. And not only does it look like it, it's actually what they call bio-inspired technology, which means the design of it, the way it works, is inspired by a manta ray. So imagine this. You're inside the ocean, right? And you see mm -hmm. a manta ray swimming. Now, it's not traveling the same way a bird does through the sky, even though it has these big wings, essentially. The way it travels is its uh, muscles and bones inside the wings uh, – kind of like ripple and like create a waving effect to create propulsion and move through the water. That's exactly what they're using this NASA grant for, this NIAC grant, is to try and develop and build exactly one of these things. I forget the exact research university. I didn't look it up. It's right there in the article. But that's what these grants do is they fund these really cutting edge advanced things. The reason this is so important is because there have been a lot of proposals about sending, you know, a lighter than air balloon, if you will, to mm. the clouds of Venus. And of course, we all know uh, last year there was this big announcement that they had found phosphine gas or the, the signs of phosphine gas at a certain altitude. I think it was about 50 kilometers, you know, like 30, 35 miles 
uh, above the surface of the planet I... in this cloudy region. And the reason that was a big deal is phosphine gas on Earth and, and other where we know it's created is typically created uh, in small volumes by some uh, geological processes. But in the volumes they found it, and at the altitude they found it, there's it's typically, if we found it that way here on Earth, that would be from uh, an anaerobic life, a type of extremophile, a microbiology biological uh, uh, organism that doesn't use oxygen and uh, instead and therefore creates this phosphine gas. And the other reason that's interesting, even before that signal was detected, there was there was this, uh, many models showed that that's the one area in Venus that you could have something living, is this certain elevation where the, the atmospheric pressures and the solar radiation and all the things, the temperature, all of that is just right, that you could have life. And then, boom, we see this gas there that seems to indicate at least there's a chance that that is what we've seen. So we've come up with these different missions to go there, like I said, like balloons that would float around. But those balloons are all pretty much dependent on the winds at those altitudes, like a, like a hot air balloon. You just got to ride right. where the wind takes you. These manta ray craft are not that. They can maneuver through those clouds. And you see it there in that artist rendering, the same way a manta ray maneuvers through the fluid of the ocean. And if they spot something interesting in the clouds, they can circle back to it. They can hover over a specific spot. They can actually maneuver. And it's all done internally. All these, uh, it's almost like an endoskeleton uh, that moves all that. And because of that, none of the joints, nothing's exposed to the corrosive effects of the atmosphere so as long as the outer surface is durable enough to take the effects of the atmosphere that internal mechanisms are all protected the one other really interesting piece of technology that they're testing under this grant for that program is the idea that the uh the thing could deflate itself to some degree and that would let it sink you know think of a ball in the uh, in the water and as it slowly loses water, air, at some point, it'll sink to the bottom, even with a little mm -hmm. bit of air in it. So that's what's happening with this craft. They can uh, manipulate it to go lower in the atmosphere and then expand it back up to go up higher in the atmosphere. So it has this full maneuvering capability to really go up there and really scope around. And they have a suite of instruments they want to put on it and uh, sensors and stuff really a, a cutting edge concept that NASA feels interested enough to put some real money behind. Wow. So cool, man. Just think if there is oh. some sort of intelligent life on Venus, we're now going to be the UFOs. They're going to be reporting these manta ray shaped <laughs> craft to their well, uh, local news. We saw line. a black triangle in the sky <laughs> the other day, right? And it was biological, I swear. It was like moving like an actual creature. Yeah. Right? That's totally. pretty cool. Yeah, a very <laughs> cool concept. And like I said, a real one. It's one that the NIAC, the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts, uh, has actually put a little bit of money into. So it may be something we see. I mentioned in that article that there are some other missions planned to Venus, uh, and NASA has some for the end of this decade uh, called Da Vinci Plus and Veritas they're working on. There's a private group uh, sending a probe up later next year called the Venus Life Finder missions. And it's really designed to kind of drop a little parachute craft through those cloud layers and see what it can pick up as far as confirming those phosphine gas and signs of life. But yeah, this is the first concept of essentially like a drone that can fly around through those clouds. And it is a really, really neat and seemingly really viable concept. Love it. Absolutely love it. Man. Oh, yeah. Well, hey, let's uh, let's move from Venus to Mars. This was another story that went viral maybe a week or so ago as we're recording this. And sure. this was the story about uh, Perseverance rover. It spotted something on Mars, an artificial yep. object. And this started going, got everyone's conspiracy theories going. And oh, yeah. um, 
unfortunately, doing your due diligence as the head science writer at the debrief, you had to set us straight and tell us what it really was. So why don't you tell us a little about this story, if you don't mind, Chris? Yeah, sure. Uh, there's a, I can't think of his name, but there's a UFO researcher on Instagram that kind of broke this story when it was first going around Twitter and Instagram. And people were sharing this picture because we all know, like, Dating back to the face on Mars and the pyramids on Mars mm -hmm. and the Cydonia region, that there's this kind of history of the cameras from time to time picking up things on Mars that at least at first glance look like there's something other than a natural formation. So we've seen that a ton over the years. Uh, I, I know there are guys, I, I think it's Mike Barra, you know, they make a living writing books about this stuff. <laughs> so here we had a picture that when you look at that picture there's no doubt like that's a thing right like that's yeah. definitely not a rock and a little farther down in that article yeah you're zooming and i have a close-up on it a little farther down in the article but yeah this created a stir on the internet i know when i first saw it on twitter i was like oh that's a thing and then my first <laughs> thought was it's probably one of our things and that was the ultimate conclusion of this researcher and that was the, what i found when i looked into it was there was a, a like a drill bit with a cover uh, and, and it was there to like protect another bit. And it was something that it dumped back in like July. And so this okay. is just a picture of, you know, unfortunately us going to another planet and doing what we do, here, which is leaving, yep. gar leaving garbage <laughs> on the side of the road. Right. So techno signatures, um, baby. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, I'll tell you, Ryan, uh, one thing I thought was cool is they mentioned in the article is, you know, maybe 100 years from now or 1,000 years from now, these could be like national parks on Mars or national parks on the moon, these areas where we leave these little bits of human technology. There may be a national park built around the whole Perseverance area <laughs> or around the Spirit and Opportunity areas or the curiosity rover because they're these little spots on the planet we think of them in these big areas but the the rovers are only you know skirting a couple of miles of area there yeah they're these like historical zones with stuff there and that drill bit will probably be studied by students long after you and i are gone they'll be like oh here was the thing that you know was left behind and created a controversial photo so it was a neat <laughs> picture and yeah, my first thought was, okay, we really got something here. This isn't a uh, this isn't a rock formation. Yep, yep. And the conspiracy f theories flew. I love it. I love it. Yeah, well, I'm it glad we have an answer. Yeah, yeah. Yes. We'll see what uh, we'll see what civilization builds up around it. You know, in terms yeah, right? of what it exactly. is, monolith like style. The, uh, <laughs> the Coke bottle and the gods must be crazy, right? Just that one too. Piece, exactly. One man. piece of technology <laughs> left behind. Yep. Well, hey, Mars, it's sort of dusty terrain. It reminds me a lot of uh, a planet from our mutual favorite, favorite universe, and that is the Star Wars universe. Oh, yeah. So you know what comes next. We have to talk about your, your next article here, Tatooine, like exoplanet, confirmed. We have an actual planet now where we could say Luke Skywalker is from. So tell us about this one, if you don't mind. So I wrote about this first last year, and then this latest article is, like you said, it's confirming it's there. Keep in mind, when we find exoplanets, whether it's the, the test, the transiting exoplanet survey satellite, or the Kepler missions, or even with Hubble, when we find them, uh, it's typically just we're going through light spectra data, and we're saying, okay, something moved in front of the planet or we're going on gravitational data and something caused the planet to wobble. So this, these, uh, uh, even though we've confirmed maybe 5,000 of these exoplanets, there are thousands out there that we've detected that signal and said, we think one's there, but we're not quite sure. And this was one of those. This was a planet that last year we found. And like you said, the reason it's so cool is because it's part of a binary star system. So when, if you were on this planet and you were to look up into the sky at the right time, you would see what Luke Skywalker is seeing in that picture right there. You're seeing two, two stars in the sky or two suns. However, from a search for life standpoint, this is actually even more exciting. And this, the right. reason why is when you go through the cosmos, 
Binary star systems are the most common. They're about half of the star systems, maybe a hair over, at least in the Milky Way galaxy. So these binary star systems are everywhere. And finding planets in them, we found a few in other binary systems like this, and they're almost always in the habitable zone of the two planets. So every time we find a binary star system, and with a planet or multiple planet candidates like this one in it, that's a brand new, exciting, high quality place to look for life. It mm. may even be the case as we find signs of life, assuming we do around other planets, because of the prevalence of this type and because of their favoring having planets in the habitable zone, it may be more common to look up in the sky on your home planet and see two suns than it is where we look up and see one. May, that just may be the more common scenario. That's so cool. I know. I, I dream of that day. I can uh, I can look over a mountain like Luke there and just see two suns or or two moons. Such maybe. an iconic shot. I seem uh, to remember reading or hearing that uh, it was like a mistake and it was like an effect of the camera lens. And it really? wasn't something that was originally intentional. And then when they looked at it, George Lucas was like, wow, uh, I don't, I, I, you know, I don't want to confirm that that's the case. You know, I've read a lot about Star Wars in the last 40 plus years. So I don't want to, <laughs> but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the origin story of this, the two suns in the, on the sunset. And the reason it's so amazing of a shot in the movie, I mean, when I was writing this article, I showed the picture to my wife and she's not a, a Star Wars nerd by any means, but she's like, oh yeah, I remember that shot from the movie. Cause it's, oh, yeah. it's epic and, you know, romantic and potent. And it's just got all these like, you know, and it's totally foreign. Like, it's like no sunset we've ever seen on our end. So you're like, <laughs> this is in a galaxy far, far away. So yeah, yeah. finding that, confirming that, and a little bit of extra news in that story is that they found it using the uh, the uh, wobble method rather than the transit method, which is how we find most pilot uh, exoplanets. So not only was it confirming it, but it was confirming it using a different method. So when the planet was originally found a year ago, uh, it was spotted because of the transits in front of those two stars. Now it was spotted because of the gravitational effects the planet has on the stars. So uh, we're pretty darn sure that planet is there. That's amazing, man. I love it. Absolutely yep. love it. They're doing incredible work. Well, let's, let's piggyback off of that to some more work that NASA sure. is doing. And that's this story you did on, um, there's a rocket that's ready to chase pulsating Aurora. This is so cool. So explain to me, if you don't mind, um, what is this aurora that they, they want to chase and why? What 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 purpose so, do they see in doing this? Uh, if you've been, I've never seen it in person, but you've been lucky enough to be at a real northern latitude at the right time. You can see the northern lights, right? That, that mm -hmm. those streaks of ribbon like colorful lights, blues and greens and sometimes other <coughs> components of the rainbow that happen up at these northern latitudes. And it's an effect of uh, solar radiation in the atmosphere and other chemical effects. Really beautiful, brilliant light show. But what they found is every once in a while, and, and, and uh, these things seem to pulsate, right? There's like a pulsating component to it that they really couldn't quite understand. Mm -hmm. And the first clue they had as to the origin, if I remember the story right, was during World War I, radio operators in Europe and, and northern latitudes were picking up these pulsating frequencies on their microphone, on like radio receivers. And they couldn't figure out what it was, but it gave a clue that there was a a sound wave component to this electromagnetic phenomenon. So what they did was the, the research team that's looking into this, oh, wow, look, that's a great picture. So <laughs> the research team that's looking into this, what they did was they took a little rocket and they put a package of instruments on it based around that idea that there is this sonic component to the sound wave component to creating these uh, um brilliant light shows and this pulsating effect in it. And uh, 
They hauled it up there to where it's most commonly seen somewhere up, I think, in Alaska, possibly. Uh, I don't remember exactly where because I write 10 to 15 stories a week. And uh, <laughs> But, yeah, they, they hauled this rocket up there, and that was last week, and they positioned it so that the minute they picked up on this pulsating thing, they can launch that thing, have it fly right over the Aurora and, and gather all kinds of information on it and really get to the bottom, like, what is making this thing pulsate? So it's just kind of a neat science story. You know, it's not a, it's not a search for life. There's no aliens behind the pulsation. Uh, but as far as, like, like, what is causing it, and the fact that again, like radio operators in World War II were picking this, or World War One were picking this up a hundred years ago, right? Wow. And now we finally have an answer. So I believe, if I remember that story right, that rocket was poised to launch as early as February twenty fourth. That was kind of when the window opened. And so my guess would be sitting here on this what second day of March or third day of March, somewhere in the March here that it's probably already launched and they've already gathered the information. But as is typical in the science world, it'll probably be six months to 18 months before we get a paper on what exactly they found. But uh, yeah, that I, I believe that rocket is already shot up there and they've already got those readings. So, uh, uh, man, it's just a beautiful... I, uh, every once in a while when I'm writing a science story, I have more fun digging through the pictures, you know, like every yeah. once in a while as a kid, it's just like, yeah, like that Star Wars picture from the one before. Uh, I think MJ Benias, our editor, picked that out for that for another article I wrote about the binary stars like a year ago. So I was digging through pictures for this one. And I, I mean, these Northern Lights images are so beautiful. So Stunning. yeah, that this was just a fun one to dig into and write about. Cool, cool. You know, and it reminds me, actually, uh, this whole concept of, like, flying something in, gathering data. Remember Twister when they put the Dorothy right, yeah. into the tornado to try to gather what's inside of a tornado, what's going on? It's Absolutely. another tornado. So maybe within this aurora, we're going to find another aurora. Or maybe we are going to find some signs of intelligence in there. Who knows, man? Who what's knows? That you know, it's safe, definitely but... unexplained. That's the thing about unexplained things in science, Ryan. They have an yep. idea of what caused it because of those World War I radio pickups and the, and the fact that it's been picked up uh, using radio technology since. But yeah, as of now, it's an unknown uh, cause, the pulsating phenomenon. Uh, well, hey, I'm looking forward to the results, and uh, and I can't wait, man. If anything, this is a beautiful image that I just oh, want to yeah. keep up I, here I, for the I, rest I, of the show. I'll admit I picked that one out. I, I had about 10 of them, and this one with the two people sitting there staring at I went, that is just beauty. That's it. That's the one. I love it. Well, hey, speaking of unexplained, let's move to this really cool story that you did that really – comforted me i know a lot of people out there you know they fear what comes after after you know we cease to be here on this planet and sure. um this story kind of uh gave me some comfort and hope you know of like what happens and what could possibly happen and we might be getting closer to answering some of those questions you have people like uh robert bigelow looking into the science of um consciousness and the afterlife and and now you have these scientists looking into what actually flashes before your eyes we know that old cliche of your life flashes before your eyes and we're coming to realize that might actually be true so yeah would you mind telling us a little about does your brain replay your best life when you die yep uh, i first of all yeah this is a, a really interesting story to look into and uh, basically what happened here is researchers had this patient. He was 87 years old. Uh, he was having uh, regular seizures. And uh, they knew he was in ill health and near the end of his life. And so they had him hooked up to MRI brain scan imaging type equipment to basically monitor these seizures to try and get an insight into... Uh, what was causing the frequency, and maybe even help him with some treatment as he was aging. And what happened was, is in the middle of one of these sessions, he had a heart attack and passed away. The, 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 as I point out in the story, that's the sad part of the story. The interesting part 
is having a guy whose brain is hooked up to all this equipment at the moment he passes away provided this treasure trove of information that you can't plan for. You know, you can't have this expensive of equipment and this level of monitoring going on on a brain anytime you think somebody might be close to dying. They just happen to be studying for another reason. And what they found was really incredible. So there's all kinds of brain waves and brain wave activity that comes out of your brain. And by brain waves, that's just the electromagnetic description of the shape the the uh, uh, electricity is taking in your brain. I mean, it's a it's a, a complex term for a simple process. But the different brain waves we often see in there, like beta waves, alpha waves, gamma delta theta waves all of these sort of things and what they found was when this guy passed at the moment of death and and for some period this period of minutes afterwards they were seeing activity in his brain in the areas of the brain associated with memory and in all of these different brainwave patterns representing like thought and uh, uh analysis and uh, you know, uh, emotion and all these other things were all mixed up, but happening in a very normal way that one would associate with almost like a dream recall state where you're having a pleasant dream, where you're remembering a great memory as a childhood or something like that. And that was the most, uh, most apt description of the wave pattern and the brain regions they were seeing in this guy is it sure as heck look like he was reliving his best life that as he was on the way out the door and even after his body had stopped functioning his brain was still playing out the end of that show wow. i think somebody contacted me via twitter and was like well isn't this a bit reductive and doesn't make consciousness a local phenomenon i thought actually if anything it, it lended great credence to a non-local conscious phenomena because after the body is not really perfectly working anymore and you are essentially dead this antenna that in a non-local consciousness theory that your brain is more like an antenna picking up on consciousness and and conveying it uh that yeah that would be what you might see is the body stop working but the brain's still picking up a little bit of signal while it's viable and what it's it's almost like a transition so it's mm -hmm. not, yes, it could be the fact that in a material world, what they caught was an image of somebody dying and, and having pleasant memories on the way out the door. But in a life after death or a continuation of consciousness or a more particular, like a quantum non-local consciousness uh, argument, which is relatively new in science, but a pretty popular area of study, um, this lends just as much credence to that area, if not more. So it was a really, like you said, Bigelow and these other ones that are kind of looking into it at this time, for them to have this chunk of information like this, where you could look at it and go, here was a guy while he was passing away, and we have this information. And this information looks like, yeah, he was, uh, he was channeling his best life. I love it. I absolutely love that. Like you couldn't plan these these things any better, you know. Yeah. And that's kind of the the beauty of science. Like a lot of it is happenstance, and we just happen to trip upon something, you know, um, unbeknownst to us at the time. And and there you go, scientific, um, you know, discovery made. You know, look it at happens things like all the time, Ryan. You know, I, I, we yeah. will joke about like like. Uh, Propecia to keep you from losing your hair was like a blood pressure medicine, right? Like this happens all the time that you find something, you're looking for one thing and you find something else. I have a, one of the stories on the list you gave me is where uh, they were looking to confirm one planet. They found a whole other one, right? So like yep. there are definitely circumstances like that. And yeah, in this case, they're studying epilepsy, they're studying seizures, and all of a sudden they're able to publish an entire paper about what happens in the brain at the moment of death, something they were not working on at all, but all of a sudden here they are publishing a paper on it because it's it's that significant of a recording, you know, the right place at the right time. Crazy, 
crazy. Well, let's let's move to that that story you were talking about about finding another planet. This is the new planet found orbiting Proxima Centauri. Now, yep. um, you know, we hear about these ideas of exoplanets and and things like that, but um, this is a little bit uh, closer to us, you know, our stellar neighbor, as it were. Yep. So, yeah, would you mind telling us a little bit about this story? Do you like stories of the strange, the weird, and the unexplained? Then we want you to check out Jim Harold's campfire. The concept is pretty simple. Jim talks to regular people about strange stuff that happens to them. And yes, that includes UFOs, along with cryptids, ghosts, and head scratchers. He doesn't exaggerate or play a lot of spooky music, kind of like I'm doing right now. The stories speak for themselves. Ones like a ghost story involving serial killer Ted Bundy, or the young man who encountered an eight-legged demon. Then there's the story of an alien abduction by what could be considered a reptilian. Now not all the stories are horrifying. Some are actually pretty heartwarming, like a visit from a past loved one or a peaceful near-death experience. Regardless, these are true and fascinating stories told by ordinary people who've had extraordinary experiences. Tune in to Jim Harold's Campfire on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to Somewhere in the Skies. And remember, stay spooky. This is, uh, this is really exciting to me. So... If at some day in time our technology is advanced enough that we're going to go to other star systems and we're going to go to other planets that aren't in our star, our you know uh, solar system, and we're going to study planets, hopefully rocky planets that are in the habitable zone that have a chance at, at, at life. Uh, what better place to start than you know the closest one, which is Proxima Centauri? <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> at one point, I believe it was 2016, they found the telltale wobble, again, using the wobble method, but that telltale shimmy of the star that indicated there was a planet there. And not only is there a planet there that they found, uh, they dubbed that one Proxima B, but that Proxima B is indeed the right orbit, the right orbital distance from its star to have water, the habitable zone, to have liquid water on the surface. So it's an Earth-like planet. It's size-wise, uh, mass, uh, and, and habitable zone. So we already knew, like, hey, if we're going to ever go to the stars, let's see if there's a planet around the closest one. They found it. So this latest study is exactly what you and I just talked about. So here we are, 2021, last year, and researchers at the, uh, I believe it was the, let me double check here. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there's the thing called the European Southern Observatory in Chile. And they have a telescope there. It's my favorite telescope name. It's the VLT, which stands for Very Large Telescope. <laughs> so it's by far the best. I mean, Hubble and all these other are great, but that's a great name. Come so on, Chile, yeah. How literal very, can you get? Yeah, the ESO VLT is about as cool as it gets, right? The very yeah. large telescope. So <laughs> researchers use this very large telescope to, again, look at Proxima and to measure the light coming from the host star and see if they could confirm that that Proxima B, that, that planet exists. And they found two things. One, yes, Proxima B is there. And two, by the way, there's a whole other planet there too, Proxima D. Oh, wow. And yes, now Proxima D is not in the habitable zone. It's smaller than Earth. It's also rocky, but it's much closer to the horse star. So think of like a, a Mercury and how close it is to our sun. And therefore, on the surface, it's like a molten lava hell, you know, right? Like mm -hmm. nothing would probably live there. And so that's what they found. So they did confirm this, the planet they were hoping to confirm. And now while we're here, there's another planet here. Now, the reason that's encouraging is because we're hoping Proxima B is habitable. 
but multi-planet systems have various astronomical advantages in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So ideally you would have like a big gas giant like a Jupiter that does and Saturn in our solar system that kind of like keep a lot of the big rocks from coming in and slamming into us and mm -hmm. uh, and killing life over and over. So signs of more planets in a, in a star system that has a habitable zone is already really encouraging. So I wrote a, another story uh, not that long ago uh, about a mission being developed using uh, directed energy propulsion. So basically you put like a satellite in space that has a, a laser and you put like a solar sail that uses that, that you propel with that laser. You know, imagine like you have a, uh, uh, like a little parachute and you're shooting it with your hose, right? And it's pushing <laughs> it forward. So this laser would hit that solar sail and this is using current technology. So this is something that's within our viable range. And if you could shoot, and the, the mission they're designing is to go to Proxima Centauri. So if you shoot that thing with the laser and you keep the laser pointed on it, you keep pushing that probe faster and faster, there is a point around 20 to 30% the speed of light where other aspects of physics get involved that prevent it from really probably traveling much faster. But mm -hmm. imagine you could get to 20% the speed of light, which seems something we will be able to do. May, may not be in my lifetime, may be in yours, but, you know, we're not that far from doing this sort of uh, directed energy propulsion. If you could go 20% the speed of light, and Proxima is a little over four light years away, my simple math tells me that's about 20 years. Yeah. Nothing, Think that's about nothing. that, right? Like, the, yeah. the, the two Mars rover Spirit and Opportunity launched to the uh, uh, Mars in the mid 90s. Like that's almost 30 years ago. So the uh, late right. 90s. The fact that like we can send a probe. Now, granted, it's not going to land on those planets. It's not going to do anything other than whip by them and take pictures <laughs> and readings and stuff. But it will do that. So. The idea that we have a first place to look that's within technological spinning distance, at least within the next 20, 30 years, and the fact that there's a habitable planet there, and the fact that we found this other planet, I mean, that is, because imagine that we went, oh, the closest star has no planets, the second closest, you know, the only place we found planets are 40, 50, 60, 1,000 light years away, 10,000 light years away. No, the very closest one has a habitable planet. Now we found another planet there too. Crazy, man. To think that like maybe it's a lot closer than we ever thought it could be. And just think of like how that would shatter the skeptics and the debunkers who refuse to say that nothing could travel here in terms of light speed. And it's, it's, it's impossible mathematically. And now like there, a lot of scientists are, turning you know turning face and saying huh we could have been wrong on this the whole time so it's well, uh, when you're, it's exciting if you, were, if you were building a case in the courtroom in 1969 at the end of blue book for uh, aliens already being here visiting us you would have to build the case that uh humans could survive long term or anything could survive long term in space mm -hmm. you would have to build the case that there are planets around other stars you would then have to build the case that some of those planets would be rocky like earth then you would have to build the case that some of them would have water then you have to build the case that some of those rocky water ones would be in the habitable zone and then you would have to build the case that yes traversing the interstellar distances for that life to get here in my lifetime, I was born in 1969, the year that men first, the humans first walked on the moon and the year that Blue Book finished up. And I can tell you that in my lifetime, everything but the last one on that list has been covered, right? Like there are planets everywhere. Humans, we can send things up into space for a year, two year journey. We, uh, they're in the habitable zone. They're rocky planets. And not only are they common, they're extremely common. Avi Loeb at Harvard said in an interview the other day that data seems to indicate that as much as half 
of the planets that are sun-like that have a star like our sun uh, have rocky exoplanets in the habitable zone. I mean, think about that. Like everyone talks about the billions of galaxies and billions of star systems. Think about the idea that like half of them would have a planet around. And then all these binary ones that we talked about, half of those or more would have these habitable zone exoplanets. So what happens to the discussion about life already visiting Earth, whether it's happening or not, but what happens about that theoretical discussion if we start finding signs of life in the atmosphere in these planets we're finding is common? Mm -hmm. What happens if you say, all right, we've spotted 25,000 planets and 10,000 of them are rocky and 5,000 of those are in the habitable zone. And of those 5,000 habitable ones, a couple of thousand of them have gases in their atmosphere that seem to indicate they have living things there. Now you have a ton of origin points of life that could be coming here. And again, you just get down to, like you said, that that interstellar distance, which is legit. It's a legitimate issue. Mm -hmm. But again, in the last 100, 120 years ago, we didn't have an airplane, right? Like we didn't have an airplane. Yeah. And here we are in, in virtually one, the oldest person on the planet, I think, is 118. And I think that it's a Japanese woman. So she was alive before airplanes flew. And in her lifetime, we're sending missions across the solar system. We have spacecraft that left in the 70s that have already left our solar system. Voyager mm -hmm. 1 and 2 have already left the solar system. Think of that in that short period of time the technological advancement, and then tell me that in 50 years or 500 years or 5,000 years that the human species won't be able to go across those interstellar distances, even with the probe, I find it a ridiculous proposition. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more, man. I think we're yeah. we're building that case, and it's, like you said, we're so close within within the span of a few decades we've been able to accomplish that so it's i can't insane. even imagine if that last one that last challenge is the only thing keeping us back like just think of when we will be able to to do that and Absolutely. who knows man could still be within the lifetime of that japanese woman who knows who knows i mean really <laughs> right we're really things are moving so fast ryan that's you know me i i report on exotic propulsion so I talk to these people that are building, working on warp drives and solar sails and directed energy and plasma rockets and fusion energy propelled rockets that could go 10%, 20% the speed of light. I mean, a bunch of technologies that, again, if you look 50 or 100 years ago, the technologies that were in development, not only have they all been developed, the ones from 100 years ago, but we've gone way past them. So these are things we're planning now. Where are we going to be in 50 years or 100 years? Uh, I think when you're doing the Ryan Sprague somewhere in the spot, sky's a 3D hologram podcast in the metaverse like 30 years from now, you may be talking about a probe zeroing in on Proxima and that habitable planet getting ready to take photos. I just don't think it's, it's that far away. Let's hope so, man. Oh. Let's hope so. Well, hey. It's so cool. I know. I know. That's why I love the stories you bring forward. This isn't like dry, you know, data driven, um, you know, mathematical stuff. Like you're showing us the ambitions of the scientists out there, the ones who are willing to ask those tougher questions and not conform to the, you know, the the status quo of science. And and that's what the debrief is all about, you know, disruptive science. And Absolutely. what's that next step? And who's willing to take those risks to ask those questions. And I know those are kind of the people that you have spoken to and the stories you're bringing forward. And um, this last one that I kind of wanted to talk to you about, at least sure. the stories I wanted to share. I know there's a couple more that are going to be coming out yeah. that you're going to tease for us here. But um, this idea, this I love this theory. I've been all about it for years. Um, the idea that we are the aliens to our own planet earthling is but a subjective term when it comes to uh who we are as a um a species so yeah apparently this theory is a lot more plausible than we think and scientists are looking further into it so would you mind telling us a little about this story of um the origins of our species possibly possibly this is as 
fundamental a science question as there is, Ryan. And I mentioned that right at the beginning of this article. Let me <laughs> fix this right here. This is as fundamental as questions get. If you look at the history of life on our planet, and you start with the earliest forms of life, maybe three, four hundred million years after the uh, after the planet first formed. So we're going back maybe four billion years in time. Mm -hmm. um, those first microscopic organisms, over time, evolved into different things, and those evolved into things. And if you skip ahead to today, all of the forms of life you see on Earth from plants to microscopic eukaryotes or whatever they call them to uh, animals to you and me. This is all relatively traceable from a scientific perspective. If you give me that first organisms, you give me those first microscopic organisms and you give me enough time and you give me just the Darwinian, you know, idea of the survival of the fittest, that over time you will get this vast array of organisms. And it's something we can trace through the fossil record. It's something we see happen every day today. So you can look at the coronavirus and see how it's evolving across generations as it continually replicates. So yeah. that evolutionary process seems to indicate that the complex life we see today came from that simple life. But the question has always been, where did that simple life come from? How do we go from zero to one? We know how we go from one to where we are here. It's evolution. And there you could argue the science and some of the aspects of evolution that people get more frustrated about. But the bottom line is there's a nice fossil record showing billions of years of evolution to get to where we are. But that beginning, that that idea of here you have a planet, it's got water, it's got rock, it's got all these minerals and things, but nothing is alive on it. There's nothing alive. And then something is suddenly alive. Suddenly right. we have one. We have microscopic organisms. And once you light that fire, it's just a matter of time and pressures to end up with complex life forms. That just seems to be the pattern. How do we get to one? How do we go from zero to one? So when I was growing up taking science classes, there was this term that scientists like to use. It was a prebiotic soup. And it was this the mm -hmm. idea that like on Earth, you had these like thermal vents and it was gurgling and there's volcanic activity and lightning and all these things kind of magically combine and boom. You have the first like amino acids turning into peptide chains, and you have those peptide chains turning into, voila, those very first microscopic organisms. And you go from no life to life, some sort of Frankenstein combination of electricity and heat and chemistry, and boom, we have life. And then from there, it's just a runaway train to get to where we are now. Interestingly, that may very well be wrong. And that's what this new study and this new research, and there's been some research kind of building here. So that old idea of the, the, the prebiotic soup, the, the magic formula on earth that takes uh, just raw material and turns it into life, that, that belief has been under fire for a long time now. And this may be the nail in that coffin, because here's what they found. We know that the, the building blocks of life, things that are called amino acids, are everywhere. They're in space and they're constantly raining down on us. They're constantly raining down on Earth. We find them in meteorites all the time. We find them in Martian meteorites. We find them in interstellar rock fragments. We find them in everything, right? So we mm -hmm. know, like, the stuff you make life out of comes here all the time. But it really did seem like you needed that that again, that prebiotic soup with the electricity and all the magic stuff to turn it into life. However, what they did in a lab is they recreated the environment of space and they showed how they could take these, uh, these glycine amino acids that are common in what it, I think they say in the 
interstellar dust cloud in the vacuum of space and in an interstellar mm -hmm. dust cloud, you'll find these. And in a simulated space-like environment, they were able to, in one step, turn that single glycine into a peptide chain, a polyglycine chain. And again, without getting too much into like biology class and how this all works, the step from not life to life has this transition you have to go through from individual amino acids to these chains that make like muscle tissue and bone and all this other stuff. But there was always this energy problem. And how do you make that happen? Well, they did it in the lab and they simulated space. They were able to take make peptide chains that were multiple amino acids long. Like I think one of the chains was over a dozen long. And again, this is like a first try experiment. And they were able to do it without the electricity or without the water. And that's critical because we always say, oh, you need water for life to form. Well, what may be the case is you need water for life to thrive. So that's what we have on Earth. We have the, basically like imagine the seeds that are blown through the air. I live in a suburban neighborhood. And all of a sudden like a, a, a plant will crop up in the middle of my lawn that is nothing I planted. <laughs> but maybe a right. bird was nice enough to plant it for me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. This really lends an idea to an argument that life is common in the universe. The planet Earth formed, and once it kind of cooled and settled down, I mean, it's getting hit with these amino acids from day one. And once it cooled down and settled down, meaning tectonic activity, enough that life could take hold, that peptide chains and the, the building blocks and the actual early life structures were being made in space all on their own and were raining down on us and we just had to be a garden capable of fertilizing that life of supporting mm. that life of giving that would be the womb for that life and maybe that's all earth is maybe we don't create life here we're just a nice batch of soil and life essentially is planted here interesting we are the fertilizer to our own planet i i love that I absolutely love that, man. It, it makes you think, you know, well, then what's the next chapter in the evolution? Well, you know, if you era? watch the movie Prometheus, right, I think that was Prometheus where this idea that, like, the guy seeded his DNA into the water to build mm -hmm. life. Well, you know, uh, that, that idea of panspermia, that idea of life across the cosmos being spread, maybe even intentionally. If you were going to intentionally spread life to another planet, as an advanced species of some sort. That was your goal. Rather than spreading something specific, if you could spread the basics, if you could spread these peptides and the and they take hold on the planet and given the materials that are on that planet, the minerals that are on the planet, the temperatures, all that things, it creates life that is more or less like unique to that planet. So mm -hmm. rather than sending down engineered organisms, go, well, We'll give them a cow and we'll give them a duck and we'll give them a woolly mammoth and a couple of people and whatever, like a, like a Noah's Ark. It's like, no, no, no. Let's just send down the seeds and what grows, grows. See what happens. And, uh, yeah. So it, it, it lends an argument, A, that life could just be everywhere, which is what those of us who are in this field, and I say it all the time, people that work at NASA, the European Space Agency, place like that, if you ask them in 2022, they will tell you their primary mission is now the search for life. That They were astronomy organizations in the 20th century. In the 21st century, NASA employs astrobiologists, exobiologists, jobs that didn't exist 15 years ago, 20 years ago, even some of them 10 years ago. So in that search for life, the idea that not only may Earth not be that unique, but life may have not even started here. Life just may be in the cosmos. It just may be something, and it just it rains down everywhere. And when it finds a nice patch of soil, I mean, drive down the street, I see little like little little twig growing up in the crack in the concrete. Earth just may be the crack in the concrete, man. And that's yeah. where life came up. I love it. I love it. Hey, Purple Rain, 
right? Right. That, yep. That's that's all I got to say the, about or that. Or chubby <laughs> rain, as my wife would say. <laughs> hey, man. Hey, we're all unique in our own ways. That's I the think point chubby of the story. rain is a we reference just from an Eddie Murphy movie, <laughs> where at the end of the movie, it's the the chubby rain. It's Eddie Murphy and uh, and uh, Steve Martin. Uh, oh, Bowfinger. I, to... ha, I remembered it. Look Bowfinger. at that. Bowfinger. Yes. yes. Chubby yes. Rain is the big line at the end of the movie. Product of the early Martin. 2000s, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's about 20 years old. It's a great film. One of my <laughs> favorite Eddie Murphy performances because he plays two characters in the movie. And the nerdy brother character is one of his best performances ever. So. I love it. I love it. He's the master at playing, you know, those sorts so of things. I love so it. True. I love it. Well, hey, man, that's all the stories that I have from uh, what I saw over at the debrief. But I know you're yeah. going to be coming out with some other ones in the coming days. This will probably they'll probably be out by the time this airs. But are there yeah. any other articles you're really excited about teasing to us here? Sure. Um, that's so, going to be coming out soon. I just put a video up uh, that should go up in the next couple of days here. So about the time this podcast comes out, you can probably go ahead and look at it. And uh Basically, there's a company in San Diego in Carlsbad, California, which is part of San Diego County, just south of mm -hmm. here in Southern California. And I wrote them about them last year. They've created a, a three-wheeled electric vehicle. It looks like an electric car, but it's got two wheels in the front, one in the back. Helps it qualify as a motorcycle, so it made it easier to get road legal. But it's enclosed, so you don't have to wear a helmet like a motorcycle. Uh, and they're called Aptera Motors. And the reason this car they created is really cool is a couple of things. And then the reason the video that just came out is really cool is a whole other thing. So what's great about this car is it's solar powered. It's a purely electric vehicle. You can park it in your driveway and it's covered in solar panels. And depending on where you live and how much sun you get, <clears throat> they say in a typical about 80% of the neighborhoods in North America, you would generate, <clears throat> excuse me, around 46 to 50 miles a day of driving energy in this car, right? So if you don't drive for two or three days in a row, you got enough, you got like 150 miles driving. In really high sun areas, if you're like in Arizona or some parts of the southwestern U.S., uh, some people calculate you'll get as many as 70 miles a day driving. But either way, so you've got this car, right? It's solar powered. If you want to plug it in and charge it, you can plug it in on a 110 AC outlet. So it'll, like, off your regular old plug, it'll get about 130 miles a day charged from that. And you can charge it when the thing is fully charged. It can go 1,000 miles on one charge. And that's always the big anxiety with electric vehicles is mm -hmm. what they call range anxiety. Anything over about three, 400 miles is pretty rare for electric vehicles. So this new video that just came out is a drag race that the company put up. And they took their newer model, their, their Aptera Motors beta model, and they took their original, their alpha model, and they put them in a drag race against an Audi R8, which is an electric car, and a Tesla Model 3, which, of course, we know Tesla is the gold standard of electric cars. <laughs> right. And... Uh, since uh, Aptera Motors is the one to put the drag race up on their YouTube channel, I think you can guess who won the drag race. But <laughs> still, it was really neat to watch because here you have a car that if, like, if you plug a, a Toyota Prius into an electrical outlet at your house and charge it up all day, you get about like eight miles of driving. If you right. plug this thing in, you get 130 miles. So it's this amazing car for that reason and the solar power. And then it's faster than the Tesla and the Dragger. So it'll go zero to 16 in about three and a half seconds. I mean, when I was a kid in the 80s, that was like Corvette times. Like you almost couldn't get cars. That, that was like Ferrari type times. Like mm -hmm. there weren't cars that even did that. So the thing's fast as heck. It's a completely road legal. When I wrote about them last year, they were shooting for the end of 2020, 2021 to get their first models out. They're not quite out yet, but they're still expecting delivery sometime this year. They're taking deposits. I don't get a commission, so I'm not selling them to you. <laughs> but uh, but if you want to go watch the video and see this really killer electric vehicle, within that story, I have a couple other videos from the company showing things. It's just a really neat vehicle. And, yeah, it, 
and uh, if a if a guy in a Tesla Model Three cut you off, you could dust him too. So. With this thing, yeah, especially yeah. if you live in Arizona. I yeah, love exactly. it, man. Well, yeah, and that's for the extra storage, but you the speed is good anywhere you live. But yeah, you can okay. get a, a extra miles of driving if you have good sun. No, the, <laughs> the sun doesn't affect the acceleration on it. Okay. Um, the one other story I was going to jump into here, yeah, at least. and this is really cool, by the way. So uh, if you cruise around the internet ever and you put in ionic wind or lifters or ionic lifters, and I think a lot of people in the kind of the UFO and, and, and science communities have done this. You mm -hmm. go to YouTube, you'll see these videos of these things. And they're usually like balsa wood triangle or a square with some foil wrapped around it. And it has wires running to it. And they flick the switch on and these things will hover. And it'll like go up in the air with like no moving parts. And as a matter of fact, the scientists that first discovered it like 100 years ago thought he had an anti-gravity effect and it was <laughs> it was known as the b-field brown effect back in the day but it's basically an ionic wind so like you know like uh, the air filter in your house those those ionic air filters where you turn mm -hmm. it on and there's a little breeze going through there right like it actually right. pushes air through but there's no fan moving <clears throat> it's just the the thick and thin uh, electronic substrates on either side using an electric charge to create a wind by, by moving the air through there. So in water, it's like an electro-hydrodynamic effect. So in air, the term they're using is an electro, uh, 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 electro aerodynamic uh, propulsion. If you could theoretically build this into a vehicle. Now, here's always been the problem. When you build one of these hobby lifters, the power plant and the battery or whatever's powering it has to be down on the ground. You got to tether to it because it's just the weight doesn't work. The thing doesn't create enough lift for the batteries to be on board. So even though people have been building these lifters for generations, you can't build one and go out and jump in it and fly around because it just, it, just the, the battery alone, just there's too much weight. The power plant alone, no matter how you power it, it can't create enough lift. Well, in 2018, some researchers at MIT built this model airplane. And I have that in the video, as well as the new update, which is, again, they're one of these groups from NASA. They got funding to take the plane to the next level. And this model plane flies with no moving parts. And on the video, you see it fly through the MIT gym. And it kind of looks like a like a Wright Brothers, like by wing, like Kitty Hawk, <laughs> sort of like really simple design. But the main thing is it's not tethered to anything. It's carrying its own, uh, uh, I, I forget what type of, they're uh, lithium polymer batteries, I believe, not lithium ion. But they're a type of battery that they were able to conserve enough of the weight and they were able to get enough lift off of this airplane in 2018 that the thing does fly on its own. Now, the reason this is really interesting is if you think about the reports of drones or or UAPs harassing the U.S. military off the coast, mm -hmm. and you think of the descriptions of some of them and their performance capabilities, it sure sounds like something you would think of as anti-gravity. But what these guys are designing <clears throat> is something that has no moving parts, is completely silent, but flies just using the power of electricity. In my mm. story, I even show a design of one that was built in the early 2000s that looks like a flying saucer. And that one actually took off the ground and hovered for about three minutes before it late set back down. And we have heard nothing about that design. And that's, that's I don't know if it's, you know, something's going on behind the scenes or whatever, but that one kind of came and went in 2006, but it's on Wikipedia. I put a link to it in the, you can look at the flying saucer one. The video of this airplane is real. And so because of that success at MIT of flying a, a vehicle powered just with the power of electricity and no moving parts, NASA said, all right, here's a chunk of money. You guys go to phase two as opposed to phase one. We want to try and build one of these that would be like a drone that can fly over an area where sound is an issue. 
So imagine like package drones, right? That we want flying in, in neighborhoods or airplanes you want flying over or even delivering medicine at 2 a.m. to a critical patient. But it's where people don't want stuff flying overhead because of noise. Imagine right. these perfectly silent vehicles that have no moving parts that fly just using electricity. So that's that's what the grant is for, is to try and develop that technology further, to create these new ducted uh, uh, type of, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of what they call them, like these electrodynamic ducts that would funnel the air in a better way and you would put them, stack them. It's a really interesting article. It's not that complex. I make it more complex than it is. But basically, it's silent, no propellant, no moving part. Now, no propellant. It is pushing ionic wind through it, but but you don't have to put any onboard propellant. You don't have to right. put like rocket fuel or something on for it to fly around. It can just fly around using electricity. So if they're already building a little plane out of it that they can fly around, the idea of one of these getting to the point of a drone, which is what they're talking about, that may be able to carry sensors on it or carry a package on it or whatever, and then you scale up to the idea of maybe you could solar power it so it doesn't have to carry the batteries on board. So there's a lot of interesting technological applications that this group is going to be looking for that. But yeah, it's called electro aerodynamic propulsion, and it is something being funded by NASA, and they got a, a real little airplane at MIT that flies. So it's pretty love cool. It. Phase two, here we come. I love oh, that, man. Oh, so cool. <laughs> so cool. Well, hey. Chris, this has been incredible, man. I knew that all I had to do is pick some headlines and we would have enough to talk about for over an hour, man. So I'm going to wrap things up here with you, but I want to thank you. Every time you come on here, I can just hear the passion and the excitement in your voice. And it shows by the voluminous amounts of articles you put out over there at the debrief. And, you know, man, it gives me hope. For the future and um i what appreciate it well, thank you ryan my pleasure man so um i, of I can course. tell you the one thing i wanted to bring up before we yeah, got please. on just because it's really happening right now is that uh, because of what's going on in ukraine i thought tim mcmillan who i work with at the debrief and who you work with uh put an interesting tweet out this morning and he said well i guess we know now that the 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 uh uaps that have hovering around our military are not Russian, because uh, <laughs> if they had that technology, uh, they'd be using it, right? They're in a live combat situation that's not going that well for them. You know, Tim's been writing these updates on the debrief with some pretty neat inside information about what's going on behind the scenes and what the situation on the ground really is. And, uh, you know, the areas that maybe Russia made a lot of miscalculations. But I thought it was just an interesting point that we've had this list of our UAPs, American secret project, Russian, Chinese, or other, right? The other was always the interesting one because mm -hmm. we always seem to be able to eliminate the first three. Well, now I feel like we can fully eliminate Russia. Tim put that out and I had like a thousand likes, but I read that this morning and I said, he's exactly right. We're in a live combat situation over there. If Russia had these things, they'd be used. So uh, I just thought it was an interesting piece of information he noted this morning. And yeah, I wanted to use it as an opportunity to promote the fact that he's just doing amazing coverage over at the debris. So you want to want to hear about like the story inside the story of Ukraine and what he's hearing from intelligence people, what he's hearing from military people, and kind of like the stuff he's sharing with us. Uh, it's really cool. So uh, yeah, what, one thing for sure, it seems those... Uh, what Ryan Graves and these other Navy pilots were seeing uh, harassing their carrier groups are not Russian. Yeah, let's hope so, man. And let's hope for the best, honestly. Um, yeah, with everything well, that going too, on of course. Yeah. But I just yeah. thought it was interesting that you can, <laughs> you can kick them off the list of the whoever's behind the UAP. <laughs> so uh, I thought that was an interesting development, as we would say. Yep. The mystery remains. I love it. Yep. Well, hey, man, of course, before we go, I have to ask, you know, besides your Twitter handle there on the screen, where can we find everything you're up to? Uh, so the, the best place, obviously, just keep going to the debrief.org. I do anywhere from eight to 15 stories a week, just depending on what I'm covering, what we're covering. Um, 
I, I know people have been private messaging me about some stories I've teased in the past. And yes, nothing has disappeared. Things are still coming. We're working on some really neat stuff. Uh, I can tell people that 2022, I, I just feel like the, the balance of this year has some pretty interesting revel uh, revelations on tap. And uh, if you want to read my writing about science, technology, any of these cutting edge things, every day at the debrief, you can follow me there on Twitter. Uh, I do have my own website, but I don't do much on it. If you're somebody who reads fantasy novels or if you want to read my science fiction novel and it comes out later this year, that website is plainfiction.com. Just like you're seeing my my Twitter is plain underscore fiction. My website is just plainfiction.com. And I think my first book is up there for 99 cents right now. So uh, knock yourself. What a steal. You are a renaissance man through and through. So Chris, of course, my man, thank you so much again for joining me on Somewhere in the Skies. Thanks for having me, Ryan. It was a blast. <laughs>